defensive tactics and self-defense technique taught to law enforcement officers is derived from the martial arts. Defensive tactics, like every other tactic, including firearms, is a perishable skill that has to be trained. Police officers don't train and stay proficient in defensive tactics. You're joining a profession where your job is control other human beings. It would make sense if you're good at it. Hey everybody, this is Tim Becker, uh, the Editor-in-Chief of Martial Art and Lifestyle Magazine, and today I've got a couple of guests uh, on a special podcast looking at the release of a documentary film called Wrist Lock, which is on police procedures, police training, and so forth, and I'm going to let these gentlemen explain a little bit more about this exciting film. Uh, today we have the director, producer, and editor, Jason Harney, and uh, the star, I guess, so we could say of the film, John Gentile, who's an old friend of mine, a uh, training partner that I've known for a long time. So welcome, gentlemen, to the podcast. Good to be here, Tim. Thank you. Uh, I guess we should uh, just kind of, I, I don't want to talk over you guys. It's your project, so I, I'd rather have you guys kind of tell us a little bit about this project. I mean, it looks amazing after looking at the, the trailer and stuff. I'm very excited about uh, having a look at this. Well, hey, um, it's it's just, it's it's another uh, documentary feature film that uh, we just finished, um, and it's going to be out uh, coming out here on uh, Amazon and Google Play, Microsoft Store, and uh, Apple TV on September twentieth. So we're really excited about it. Um, so the film's called Wrist Lock: The Martial Arts Influence on Police Use of Force. And you were correct. Uh, you know, John Gentile is the main subject of the film, and uh, it basically. Uh, follows him on a journey to discover uh, some of the things that any police trainer will certainly tell you, uh, regardless of what agency or department they work for currently or retired. And that is that there are a lot of issues when it comes to police training, specifically when it comes to defensive tactics. And uh, the film explores the fact that uh, every tactic that law enforcement officers are taught in the United States is derived from the martial arts. A lot of mainstream people don't realize that, but that's where the techniques come from. And the idea really in, in utilizing John, who's a, you know, a, a lifestyle practitioner of so many different martial arts going on for well over 40 years now, is the fact that we're teaching these techniques based on martial arts to police officers, um, <clears throat> but they don't practice. They don't have passion to learn the techniques and master them to a level necessary to perform uh, and have successful outcomes and use of force situations. Martial artists are good at what they do because they have those traits such as mindset, discipline. Uh, they, they master their techniques through decades of practice and police officers were, were almost expecting them to do the same, but minus the part where they actually do the training. One of the unknown facts in this country, there's 18,000 police departments, about 850,000 cops uh, in the United States. Most police academies will teach police officers defensive tactics, but when they graduate the academy, in most cases, they never have any recertification training. There are dozens of states in the United States where there's no requirement. So if the agency doesn't put forth the effort to do it, now you go five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, and cops have not done anything in the way of uh, handcuffing, baton training, self-defense, and any other tactic that they're quite literally utilizing every day. And we wonder why we once in a while have incidents where communities become outraged due to poor performance. And I look at them, I go, why? Why are you so confident in this guy who wants to attack you or when you're having a conversation saying, if somebody comes at me in this situation, I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that. And I start to wonder, well, why are you so confident? You don't train. And what we show on the martial arts side, which is to me really good because it kind of has a cr good cross section. It's not just about police, but when you think about what martial arts are gonna give an average person, one of the things is foundation, right? They're gonna give them confidence. You're gonna feel better about yourself. You're gonna be performing, maybe, uh, you know, have a better lifestyle, you know, at least be active. And we take that, premise of all those good things you do get from martial arts. And if you weren't in the military, martial arts can substitute to help you with some discipline and some regular, see regular training is the big issue because regular training, let's face it, if we take all that stuff and we move it to policing, you're going to make better decisions being a regular practitioner. 
You're going to have confidence. You're going to be confident in your abilities. You're less likely probably to use force knowing you can use force effectively. And with that being said, um, the film does a pretty good job going to different martial arts people, uh, which, you know, prior to the, you know, this is all prior to COVID type conversation. What we came up with was, you know what, we need to show versatility because you know, some people don't, but you know, uh, that fighting is in ranges. You know, you need to know how to pretty much do everything. We expect a lot of the cops. So it's incumbent upon them and the agencies that are accountable to the public as well to provide good training and the officers are incumbent upon getting out there to do it. And, and you could take this for, for like any job or any lifestyle really about the health benefits and you know the mental benefits of martial arts training and training regularly will give you a higher percentage chance of actually being able to perform you know, during a stressful time. You know, yeah, that's still the, the, the unknown component of all training, of course, is will you be able to do it in stress? And, and you know, policing does have a lot of scenario-based stuff, which is good, but really not enough. And I think Jason, you know, obviously it's something Jason and I have talked about for 20 years. And, you know, long after this film is gone, we, we keep saying, you know what, the film is a conversation piece. If it promotes conversation, uh, that's a good thing. You know, I have... Uh, somebody that I know that came to the film in May who was not very cop friendly. I could just tell you this. When she came out of that film, she said to me, she said, you know what? Okay. I have a newfound respect for policing and, and some of the things that you guys are up against. And now watching some of the hurdles you guys have had with the, the training aspect and how it's beneficial, it, it kind of really changed her mind. So I don't want to be too long-winded, but that, that, you know, those, those are all conversations, but the martial arts component obviously is, is the component of where everything comes from. And you can't always get everything admitted. There is bureaucracy, there is policy, but you also have to like dumb it down for these cops. They don't, you know, typically they should be getting training on their own. I think, you know, the three of us would agree that you need to get up out of bed and go train. You need to do stuff that's physically fit and good for you. And you are accountable to the community that, you know, there's stakeholders in, every, in all this as well. So, you know, there is that, but there's also that part of the administrations. Uh, you know, we need, to make, we need to make cuts. So what's the first thing that we cut? Training. You're not going to cut, you know, cops being on the street. We, we know we need cops and firemen and first responders. But what you're going to do is you're going to cut the training. You're going to cut the time of training, things like that, which is, you know, part of the part of the issue right well certainly yeah because i mean i think the political answer a lot of times that we see is more and more right so more as far as bodies more and more cops seems to be the answer though not understanding what kind of support mechanisms need to be in there um fortunately i think through the 40 years of being in martial arts as i've been i've had the chance to meet and talk with a lot of uh, policemen such as yourselves and and they're all they're actually both like you guys are the older guys you know for the most part because I don't meet a lot of the younger guys you know I don't see them around but the older guys I, I know and I hear the same thing over and over again which has to do with the consistency of the training and what have you and some of the answers that I've heard or some of the issues that I've heard are the same thing you just brought up John which happens to be <coughs> sorry the the budget idea so it's like yeah we cut so we cut money to the training and um you know and, and then i think it combines too with this element that you're talking about having a person who's sort of anti-cop in there and so you have you know this reaction from the public which is just they don't want to engage maybe they don't realize how much power they have because i think as voters we tend to control at least we control the people who control state budgets and such and city budgets a little bit more that if we were a little bit more active on that level politically, we could demand our state and local um, governments a lot more budgeting for that. Yeah, and I think one thing that the film tries to get across is uh, maybe some education, you know, to the to the public because that's the the biggest hurdle is, you know, all intentions are good, but sometimes the message just doesn't get out, and you know. We're, we're accountable, obviously, to the public as public servants. And, you know, right. our job is to, you know, our job encompasses a lot of things, but we got to be able to perform. And that mental health, 
that, you know, the physical and the mental kind of work together, you know, and, um, you know, we do expose some of those issues in the movie and we're not, you know, it, it, I, I'd say it's pro police, but we do point out some things that are um, some issues that are there that, that have to be addressed and, and should be you know, right, Jason. <laughs> Well, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, uh, John and I were both uh, longtime police trainers on our agency. And, and uh, in this film, we traveled, you know, uh, all over California, Utah, Arizona, Texas, Florida, uh, of course, here in our hometown of Las Vegas. And you talk to police trainers from very large agencies and small agencies across the country, and they'll all tell you the same thing. As police trainers, when you see one of those incidents, uh, on television where we also know that granted you're seeing a few seconds of video, you're seeing the part that is going to get that mainstream uh, news, de depending on what flavor one watches. We know there are several options, but they all do the same thing. They are a business. And so they're going to show you the, the most uh, vital portion of the encounter that of course is going to make the cop look bad because that fits the narrative. We know this. Um, they, it's not realistic in, in the George Floyd incident, for example, for them to show the 11 minutes that happened before the infamous eight minutes. Uh, as a police trainer, we're going to look at every second of that video and see where we can improve training. Uh, and that's really what this film is about, is making the understanding to the mainstream public that every one of these encounters, and as martial artists, we know this, a fight is ugly. There's no way around that. In, in the age of uh, handheld video, cell phone cameras, and body cameras, you're simply not going to uh, give the public what they want to see when it comes to a cop with a cape who can kick everyone's ass, superhero style, and make it look pretty for the video camera. It's just not going to happen. That's not what a fight is. Um, and not to mention, a lot of these incidents are always going to be predicated on the suspect's actions in the situation where the officer is typically just reacting to what the suspect does. But again, the media doesn't really cover that. So we want to talk about that. All that being said, police departments currently are doing a very poor job at training their cops. And myself and the people in this film, who all have an extensive training background in both police training, martial arts, and other experts in the film agree that in order for law enforcement to move forward, the culture has to change. Training has to become something that is uh, ingrained in police officers throughout their careers. Physical fitness has to be taken more seriously and mental health cannot be allowed to become compromised. Otherwise, you're gonna have situation after situation where cops are either gonna overreact or they're gonna underreact to a situation because as John said earlier, they're not confident in themselves and they're not confident in the skills that they possess. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think I really like that, you know, after watching the trailer a bit, it's kind of seeing that that approach that you guys are taking where it, it, it seems like there's a lesson for everybody in here. There's a lesson for the police departments, there's a lesson for the general public. And uh, with hope, I hope, you know, as you'd said earlier, this is a great conversation starter because it is a big conversation and, and something, you know, any kind of culture change in this manner doesn't happen overnight and certainly uh, needs to be done by large conversations that are held over and over again, hopefully by open-minded people. Um, so how did you guys come about coming together and doing this project? I mean, it's such an interesting project and I can't think of anything that I've seen out there uh, that's not, you know, this isn't exactly a training film, I, I don't think, even though it has that aspect to it probably, but uh, it's, it's an informational film, uh, something that inspires action, I think, right? I think the action's on purpose, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I am the stunt man. It's kind of, uh, you know, I, I basically go on the journey in the film and meet all these different people. We're asking their opinions, but in the beginning, prior to maybe getting with them, you're going to see me get worked over. And uh, that's okay. <laughs> but, you know, well, that's fun. We enjoy that every time you come down. The <laughs> well, you got to have fun, right? So you got to give and take. But, uh, I think that that's part of, you know, keeping the audience attention, but, you know, there is a, uh, you know, a part to that. Uh, and, and you would agree, you know, because, because of the, the way you train yourself, Tim, is that uh, we're trying, we tried to showcase different people all related to police training, some coaches that were, that are very well known. And we wanted their input, of course, because, you know, that's how you have to do it. But uh, 
all the training was was like uh, Anthony the Hitman Brown, and he fought in K1. His primary martial art is you know kickboxing, high boxing. Mm -hmm. He's fought in K1. He's he had some pretty good fights. You see a knockout on our on our documentary. Actually, it looks makes him look real good. He's in the ring wow. he's doing it, uh, and he's quite a character. And he was a police officer for like some twenty plus years. But as an example, he has that Thai background. We managed to integrate different systems and styles of people who still had vested interest in police training and were police or had ties to the police. So I think in that aspect, that's an entertaining part of the film. It's not necessarily what the film's about. You're not going to learn techniques, but they're all preaching, you know, things that could work for an average officer because an officer with limited amount of time, if they don't come to Inasanos, which, you know, I, we, we meet there every year, right? But how many cops do you and I actually know or see in the room? I, I would have probably been introduced to a bunch, but there's, um, not a lot. there's not a lot. I mean, no. you would agree with me, right? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. 100 people in there, and there's maybe like two cops, maybe a couple yeah. of former military guys, but not a lot. And that's kind of like, looking around there for years. And even when I had Larry coming in, we did not have a lot of cops. I mean, Jason was a student of mine. So Jason came, actually Jason knew Larry. He felt Larry, which is good. Uh. That's always good, <laughs> good training. And, and uh, I appreciate that, Jason, that was good. But you know, the whole thing is um, that, it, you know, there's not a lot of extra effort going that direction that really should be. Now, I think it's gone up. I think like in Vegas, we have so many MMA gyms. It's like popular LA. I'm, there's tons of gyms in LA, right? So it, it could very well be higher in some areas, you know, but uh, there's a lot of small towns throughout the country and in Texas and some areas where they don't get, you know, as much training. Now it is incumbent on them to seek it out, but their agencies do not supply them with enough training. And when they do get it, it's all dumbed down. You can't learn anything fancy. Not when you're only doing a couple hours every three months, you know? So if you're lucky. So why is it, do you think that, that uh, this isn't sought out more by uh, police officers? I mean, I, you kind of think, I think sitting from the outside as I am, I think, okay, this is important to my survival every day. It seems like a no brainer. Um, why do you think there is a disconnect? I, I think, uh, like we talked about a little bit earlier, it's, it's a culture issue, you know, I mean, uh, and this is covered extensively by various people uh, in, in the film, including John, some of the th stuff he's already talked about. And, you know, you, you bottom line is, I'll give you an example, the physical fitness situation. So you take it, you take the test to become a police officer. And this is with any agency, you're going to take a physical fitness test, probably to get on the list. And then you're going to take it at the beginning of the academy, you're going to take it at the end of the academy. But once you graduate the academy, you never have to jump through that hoop again, your entire career, which has never made sense to me and a lot of like-minded individuals where physical fitness is, is, you know, basically our lifestyle. It's really important. We understand it from, especially from the health perspective, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So an, an argument that we would make is to say, well, at this point, uh, say next July 1st of 2023, everybody you hire from that point on has to take that same test on an annual basis, similar to the military, where it is uh, it, it is gender and age specific standards that are court defensible and, and are indicative of your ability to physically perform the tasks of the job. But no department in this country does that, like as in zero, including the one John and I worked for. And so it's like a, like a push up minimum, yeah. like a yeah. pile run kind of thing. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, your question is, what? why is it that officers don't do this on their own? Well, because it's not required. OK, uh -huh. so life, life gets in the way. And, and you know, uh, John, uh, we were talking the other day and he had made mention that if you looked at his academy class from uh, 30 years ago, uh, a lot of guys, um, you know, don't look. They're unrecognizable at this point, you know, because there's 20 or 30 or 40 pounds of additional body mass. And right. uh, that's just the truth law enforcement wide. So until you make uh, hardline policies that tackle those issues, there's really not going to be a, any incentive for a police officer to stay in shape during their career. And the same goes for the defensive tactics realm too. 
Uh, if you're in the middle of Blanco County, Texas, as a sheriff's deputy, and your department is not providing you training, well, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of places in Blanco County, Texas, where you can go train in BJJ or, uh, you know, Filipino martial arts or wrestling or boxing. It's just not going to be accessible to you. Yeah. Not to mention, again, life gets in the way. People have families. They have other hobbies and things to do. And if they feel like if their agency is not going to require them to do it, well, why would they go do it? So again, to me, it's a culture thing. And that's really what we try to address in this film. I think we even go one step further because we bring in just lifestyle. And, you know, there's some things that, you know, we've all done in the past, <laughs> but, you know, drinking, smoking, you know, maybe you work weird hours, maybe you have a divorces, maybe you have you know, kids, you know, life does get in the way. We, we already know that yeah. you, know, you have to prioritize. Right. I mean, you know, preaching to the choir probably for all of us, but you know, you have like some things and then there's some things that are just inherently not good. You know, you could be somebody who lives at a bar all the time, you know, uh, you know, it's not, not the best, you know, so you have to have a balance. And um, bottom line is, you know, in the film itself, if you're a lifer, someone who will do stuff regularly, we're trying to show that if you have a regular or much more stable lifestyle, and you train and you work out and you do the things you're supposed to do, you're going to make better decisions should that time come and you have to do this stuff. I mean, it's better for you anyway, but you're going to make better decisions in the police field. You know, I mean, we know that there's a lot of pluses for everyone, you know, I mean, martial arts, I can't preach it enough, you know? Yeah. I like the lifestyle approach. I mean, I think there's a shortage of <clears throat> research and documentaries out there about things about how diet affects all this stuff, how, the actual um, physical benefits of exercise help psychological as well as the physical. Uh, in fact, there was uh, that research done at UCLA using FMA in general, looking at cognitive uh, function uh, benefits to that. And it had to deal with 3D spatial rotation and this sort of thing. But, you know, in the end, that translates as things that will probably help you not uh, get dementia and things like that. But, you know, better cognitive function quicker cognitive function is, is certainly, I think, an attribute that uh, any police officer would, would want to have. So, yeah, I, I like that approach. I think that's, you know, you've got a, a whole package with different elements in there, but you put all these little little uh, spark plugs in there and they're all firing properly. You've got a you know, finely tuned engine, so to speak. You know, Tim, one of the things that we did is uh, we went out to Austin and we spoke with Dr. Jonathan Scheinberg, who is a, a cardiologist who specializes in treatment of first responders. And he himself is a reserve lieutenant for the Austin Police Department. So he absolutely understands what, you know, a police officer's job is and what it entails. And early in his interview, one of the uh, statistics that, you know, he puts out there is a study that was conducted that indicated that the average person in the United States lives to be 79 years old, while the average cop lives to be 57, which is a 22 wow. year disparity. And that is far and away the largest disparity in any work related group in this country. So now was that in like work related deaths? I mean, were they, they eliminating the idea of being killed on the job and just, just saying just. It, it, no, it, it, it's, it, it includes work-related, I'm sure, but it's the whole spectrum. In other words, same, same, same uh, applicability to a regular person as in their entire lifespan. What is the average? I mean, it's no secret that sometime around the five to seven year mark, a lot of police officers pass away after retirement and we're all dying too early. And John, you know, uh, hit each one of them uh, just a few minutes ago when he's talking about, you know, lack of exercise, poor diet lack of sleep and the stress yeah. level that an officer endures throughout their career is kind of like, you know, just a, a really horrific cocktail when it all comes together and contributes to those deaths. There's no question about it. Well, I think in the movie too, we talk about some things that, you know, we're all familiar with, but, you know, drive-throughs, fast food, things like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cops, cops in, in Vegas, of course, they're eating. What do you eat at three in the morning, two in the morning? A bar, yeah. a bar What's that's available. open. Yeah, whatever's available. And so we talk about alternatives to that and, and you know, how, because your body can function better with better food, you know, as we know. <laughs> I, we all cheat for pizza once in a while. Well, yeah. Proverbial <laughs> gut bomb has been said, right? 
but but you know it, it's it's we're just talking real about like you know you could pack a lunch there, there are alternatives that you could do i mean graveyard and some of those shifts are you know obviously if you're on a rotation or something like that could affect your performance as well maybe you don't think as properly or maybe you didn't sleep well during the day i'm not sure that normal people sleep during the day i did for 10 years and i'm, I'm kind of kooky so um, but, but that's that, you know, it doesn't seem normal, you know, and, uh, you could easily, some people don't adapt to that, you know? So, yeah. Um, well, I, I do live it, John. I remember, uh, when I first met you, you were a little chunkier than you are now. And I mean, you've really <laughs> slimmed down. You, you look great, you know, over the, the last couple of years. So, you know, I think as a person who kind of, uh, walks the walk there, I, I think you're a great example. I've fluctuated through the years. There's no, no uh, lying about that. Um, you know, cause if you look at my higher and on picture, 187 pounds, things change over time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds like my high school graduation picture, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, we can't compare ourselves in those, uh, young <clears throat> age now. <laughs> well, what's, what's funny is, uh, when we're in the gym or, you know, when we see each other, even the minor things, you know, when you, you know, you run into a lot of us are in the 50 something category, 60 yeah. something category. Mm -hmm. right? And it's just funny because you talk to everybody and we, I don't think any, anybody can do exactly what they used to do when they were 35. It's, it just is right. what it is. You know, you have fought through injuries because you're still there. That's good. Right. You, yeah, know, yeah. you know, a whole lot more, but you also know, like, I don't want to do guillotines all night. I'm going to probably tap a lot quicker than I used to. Yeah. Life lessons of uh, training, you know? Yeah. But you yeah. didn't know that at 35 because you were like, guys got my neck. I'm going to try to get out of it as long as it yeah. takes me to get out of it. Yeah. You didn't realize you were going to be this old. <laughs> yeah. 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 I didn't, the, the mileage was not a consideration like it is now. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and so even with cops, you know, you get a, you get a group of cops that are on the back end of their career you know, you just got to know your audience. So, I mean, even if you're a DTI or defensive tactics guy, you got to know who you got there because otherwise you'll get working right. comp slips coming in. Yeah. The guy who has not done ground defense starts doing it. He hasn't done it for what? Seven months. I mean, he, he might not have done it hardly at all. Jason right. knows this because we've, we've, we've had complaints thrown at us periodically, but you know, cause you're trying to get the most out of the guys within a short period of time. Those are the ones that aren't showing up at your gym. They're not mm -hmm. coming to seminars you sponsor. They're not coming to things you post up and go, hey, this is a really good thing for you. You know, that sounds great, but they need to get there. Well, speaking of some, some magnif magnificent old guys with some knowledge, you've got some pretty interesting folks. And in you got Eric Paulson, you've got Tony Blower, you've got Forrest Griffin. Uh, how'd you go about getting all these folks for your, your film? Well, you have to figure, John and I, you know, uh, our, our time in, in training in both of the martial arts side, particularly with John, and then mine on the police side, go back, you know, multiple decades. So in that time frame, especially working for a large agency, you tend to meet a lot of people and work around and with a lot of people. So, you know, this was one of those situations when we were kind of casting this and, and, and putting together our wish list, we were very fortunate because we never got a no. Everybody loved the pitch for the project and, and was more than willing to give us uh, their time uh, and participate. And, and that was really awesome and a great thing for the film because as you said, uh, we we're very fortunate to get some of those names and our experiences with them was uh, uh, fantastic. They contributed so much uh, very good information that people will see that we really hope will open some eyes. Well, we knew a lot of people in general. And, you know, of course, Eric Paulson and myself uh, go back to like the 90s with Larry Hartzell, right? Uh, you know, because Eric was probably his most prized student back then. But, and of course, <laughs> Eric was on tour with Larry for a, a while and even did a, uh, like, a, they did a camp out in Vegas and, you know, I don't have to say too much about him. Uh, most of the people that are watching your show know Eric Paulson. And if you don't, you should. <laughs> Why can't that fight training cross over to the police officers? You know, just speaking on him, um, you know, I've always known him to be the most, one of the most open-minded guys. And, and just like uh, Guru Dan would always say, you know, his mind is like, it just, you know, he remembers everything, right? I mean, there's not a thing he doesn't. But he was like super, all of them were like really good. Eric was excellent bringing us to his gym and 
you know, spending, you know, six hours or so with me, working me over and, and basically training me a little bit, helping me out with some basics. And, um, you know, I'm just, I, I was just happy as hell that, you know, he was able to make the time because he's a busy guy, as you know. And uh, yeah. so he, he kind of figured it out. I had talked to him actually at Guru Dan's like years ago. And I said, hey, we have this project that's coming up online. And, uh, and I kind of told him and he says, write me in, you know, I mean, that's his support for like wanting things better. And, and, you know, you could easily say, you know, all there's a little self-promotion for each person, but it wasn't really about that. It was about him giving, you know, wanting to participate, wanting to support the police. Yes. Change is good. You know, especially if it's positive change that we can make. So he was on board, Tony Blowers in, in California. Tony has his own thing going where Eric kind of does his thing. Tony does his thing. And you'll see that Tony has the fist suit apparatus. Or, or I like works. that thing. That looked amazing. Yeah, it's called high gear and it weighs, it's a lightweight thing. I don't want to be a commercial for Tony, but <laughs> when you watch the movie, you see me in the gear. Uh, I take some pretty good hits. And, you know, one of the components that we have debated, martial arts people, you, you probably debate it yourself, Tim, being an instructor, is some, some arts are like more like force driven, meaning there's a resistance all the time, like wrestling, mm -hmm. you know, we grapple, you know, you're not going to give me your arm, you know, boxing, Thai boxing. And then there's those, the other arts that are kind of in between, like C-Lot and Kali and all the other things. So one thing I'll say that I do like about Tony's aspect is creates another method of having stress you know, a little fatigue factory, having the safety gear. I mean, I took some elbows. I took some knees. Uh, I had a mark on my head that went across my forehead. But you know <laughs> what? <laughs> you know what? I felt it. You know, I was a little stunned by a couple of the shots. But, you know, in reality, I walked away and I go, okay, you know, this is good. This is good because, you know, I'm basically doing an investigation. I'm trying to right. come across that way. Tony's obviously got all that gear that, which is called high gear, by the way, if anybody's ever interested in that. Um, but it is lightweight. And in, in police academies, we've had both. And Jason can elaborate more, but we had a red man and we had high gear. If you remember the red man, if you owned it or tried it, or you did a rape prevention class, it's really thick. It's great for hammering. I mean, you can destroy it, kick the groin. I mean, it's good. If you got some women... Yeah you know, or, or young people that don't know what they're doing. Like a big man suit or something. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But you can't, if you're in the suit, you're really limited. You can't really yeah. do a lot. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it does have use of course, but like when you get to the high gear, the difference is you and I could go at it, Tim. And you know, whether one of us takes a fall or whatever, we can still get hurt, but yeah. we're not, we're not, you know, we're going to feel the impact, but nothing compared to like real. You know, right. I mean, yeah. you feel the force, you definitely, you know, the pad is like really, really thin, but it's uh, quick to put on, which is another plus. Cause if something takes a long time to put on, you're not going to use it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, the yeah. Other I mean, amazing there. And I mean, to be able to feel that force is good and not get hurt because you can think about it and go, Oh, put that one in the notebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. I took one there. And I mean, you know, you know, okay, that would have been bad. And I think it does help you adjust uh, the thing. And I, I like the mobility look of it. When yeah. I said, I, I saw, you know, you were, you were doing some takedowns in it and some, and some grappling as well as the striking where I definitely don't think you could do that in a big old Michelin man. So you kind of fall over and there you go. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 So if any trainers out there looking for like a good suit, you know, anything that replicates that or is close to that, if you're running a program where you need to do self-defense simulations or for police, we do like scenario based type stuff. It's good to have. And, yeah. you know, because we would do scenario based stuff on a regular basis. Guy comes out, he's got a knife or something like that. Drop it. Sometimes he drops it. Right. So, I mean, you know, you have to do scenario. Ah, I drop mine all the time. when I'm <laughs> training. I'm my own I, worst. <laughs> I had a class one time. I told a guy, I go, all right, your hands are up like this. You know, you, you know, you tell him, hey, drop the knife. The guy without even having any instructions, he drops and I go hey, over. <laughs> this is great. I wish other people did that. Right. But they, they don't. But the, yeah, the, so the suit was really good. He was great. Eric, Eric, like I said, Eric's gym is phenomenal. Uh, Blower's got a great program. And then of course, Forrest Griffin, the other coach, uh, those were like some of our coaches that, that actually had an impact on policing and, and had some impact. Uh, Jason got Forrest Griffin.
people get to you, like physically get to you, break that distance, you know, and have their hands on you, having the confidence and the ability to know you were trained and that you're in shape and that you've been in these situations before in a practice environment is going to lead you to be able to make better choices in that instantaneous situation than you would without that training. Well, you know, one thing I, I don't think a lot of people are aware of is uh, before he became the Forrest Griffin that we know as the UFC Hall of Famer that he is, he was a police officer for four years in the state of yeah. Georgia. Yeah. So I, I can tell you from uh, our doing our segment with Forrest, you know, aside from some of the, uh, I think he, he showed an arm drag and some other stuff with John, but uh, the interview we did with him was very enlightening to the level of, of his knowledge of police use of force and the rules of engagement and the standard policies that apply, you know, to everybody in law enforcement in the United States. He was very, uh, spoke very intelligently on those topics, which was great for us because, you know, he, pre he presents a lot of uh, very important material on the film and we kind of use him as a segue into an argument that the film makes in the culture change uh, chapter, which is, okay, so you're an MMA fighter, let's say a UFC fighter, and, and you're gonna fight a guy uh, in December of this year, you sign the paper tomorrow, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna go into an eight to 12 week camp, right? And in that camp, as Forrest explained, you're gonna have a wrestling coach, a jiu-jitsu coach, a striking coach, a head coach, a dietitian. Uh, you're gonna have all of these people that are gonna be in play they're going to create the best version of yourself the day you step into that cage. You will have seen film on your opponent. You will have studied your opponent. You're going to understand the holes in his game. What does a police officer get before they go into their next fight? Need I say more? Right. Absolutely right. nothing. Right. Okay. It's they might man. have had a training in their man, academy right. 5, 10, 15 years ago. You know, they, they, they probably ate something horrible for lunch before they were in the fight. Uh, they have a vest that constricts their breathing. They're carrying 25 pounds of gear. Uh, the training and, and the physical fitness is so inconsistent in this country. You really can't expect that a cop would succeed under those circumstances. And we know that no, no fighter would ever sign on the dotted line and walk into a cage under those circumstances. But theirs isn't going to end in death. Uh, a police officer has so much more on the line on both sides of that coin. Right. And Jason, military, right, too. Even the military would have intel before they would go in. Of so, course. Yeah. So it's yeah, like it's a very being done in this country. I mean, a little earlier, you had brought up the, you know, the power of voting and, and the fact that, you know, the populace has that power to determine how their leaders are spending their budgets. And that's a really great point and super important when it comes to what we talk about in this film, because in my opinion, I believe that the majority of police departments, and when I say majority, I'm about a very, very high percentage, each and every day are okay with sending their cops into potential use of force scenarios, knowing full well they're not proficient in their defensive tactics, that they're in poor physical condition and often obese, and that their mental health may be compromised. That is happening as you and I and John are talking right now, every day. So as a, as a person, that is not a law enforcement, I would ask, you know, are you okay with that? No, it sounds very scary to me for everyone involved. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if I had to nail it down, that is what the theme of this film is. You know, the reality of Tim is it's more of a harsh critique on our profession, but it mm -hmm. is pro police in the sense that we want it to be better. I mean, police aren't going to go anywhere. They, that, that line has to be there. Uh, right. Otherwise, society will devolve into complete chaos. I don't think we, we need to even go there. But as long as the police are going to be there, there are certain standards that need to be upheld. And I'm telling you, as a police trainer with, with two and a half decades of experience, that is not happening. Hmm. Very interesting. So I, I was looking on, on your website, and it seems you've screened this film for audiences so far a couple of times, right, or more? John? Well, we had in May, we had like a, a soft, like, you know, public opening of the film. Uh -huh. So we did that. And then there was a focus group, I think, prior to that, you know, of uh, film people that had looked at it just to ensure that we were on the right track. 
even okay. though Jason's what kind of uh, what kind of reaction and feedback have you been getting from those screenings? For me, uh, the feedback's been excellent. Yeah, I've had some really good stuff, but the you know obviously Jason gets more podcasts <laughs> on the on the film and people talk. He's got the focus group, so Jason. Well, yeah, that was just something, Tim, and I know that you're you're you've been involved in in the uh, I, I believe the post production side in in uh, Hollywood for multiple decades yourself. So yep. you know as well as anybody. Yeah, you're you're always going to uh, have a group of people that you know don't have a dog in the fight, you know, and and, and are people that uh, will give you their honest opinion. And, and I have right. a, a fortunate to have a number of those throughout both the police world and the film industry. Yeah, that took a look at the film back in April. Uh, when I had a cut that was suitable to show. And uh, yeah, as John said, we did a, a, a friends and family premiere in May, but really September 20th is where this thing is going to be going uh, on the worldwide stage for the first time. So we're really uh, excited to see what people think. And like I said earlier, I, I hope it opens some eyes. Indeed. Yeah, that sounds uh, fantastic. And, you, and you've got, uh, let's see, Apple, Google, um, I forgot all the ones you Amazon you Microsoft store. So that's great. That's that means basically it's a purchase or rental type situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. But that definitely I think covers almost everybody. I think has access to at least one of those things. I would hope anyway. Yeah, it'll also be out on dozens more platforms worldwide. It's going out in Asia, Europe, Canada. Uh, by by the end of December, it'll be out on a, a, a literally another hundred platforms. So it is. Uh, it will be uh, out there, and, and we're hoping that uh, as many people as possible engage with it. You know, obviously, coming from the filmmaking side of things. You, you really don't jump into a project like this unless it's a passion of yours, you know, and, and John and I have spent the last uh, year plus uh, getting this thing to where it is today and, and ready to uh, be screened, you know, by, by the masses. And, uh, you know, I, I really think that the process has led us to something that you know, could be a, it could be a game changer in certain circles. Because like I said, a lot of people, you even said it yourself, nothing really like this out there that takes a look at these topics from this perspective. So we're really excited about that. And I would say the other perspective would be like people that know you, Tim, and, and people that I know, like martial arts people who maybe aren't going to engage with police, trainers, you know, martial arts trainers, things like that. There's just a lot you get from martial arts that we try to pump up in the film, not just the origins, not just the ranges of fighting, which there's going to be a portion that talks about, you know, basically you got to know the kick punch, got to know grapple, you know, the unknown, unpredictable weapon, you know, that comes out that's covered in the film and they're in different chapters. But as a martial artist, like looking at the film, even if you look at it and go, well, I'm not going to be a policeman. This really doesn't apply to me. It's a pump for martial arts as far as the demeanor of martial arts itself, what martial arts can do for you, you know, leadership, confidence, your body, something healthy to do rather than unhealthy. There's a lot of great aspects of martial arts that are positive, even outside of uh, policing or anything else. So we do try to push that out there uh, because it is it's martial arts origins of what we're teaching. Yeah, all this, stuff, all this stuff comes from a martial art that was introduced. You know, it's just like uh, you know, Guru would say, right, with the infamous wrist lock, right? The the don't show anybody this, but everybody does it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but they teach that they teach that in every police academy. They may not teach it the way you and I would like them to teach it, but right, they teach some form of that. You know, so um, you know, it is what it is, right? So, <laughs> So yeah, so there's a plus there for people who are not entering into policing and stuff like that. It's for us, it's it's also got a component of motivational. You know? Absolutely. Well, you know, I can see, I, you know, if someone says that there's there's not something in it for them because they're not police, um, you know, I think if you're not interested in martial arts and you're not interested in that, perhaps I suppose it's maybe not your your bag. But as a martial art person. Even if you're not a policeman, you are a, a tax-paying citizen, so it's probably something good to, to look at. Yeah. Uh, so you have an idea of of what's being done there. You know, you're going to interact with police, especially if you're a martial art person. 
as we said, there's maybe not many in your dojo, but there might be one or two. And, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a good idea to kind of understand their line of work, especially if you're teaching them yeah. as well, you know, to, to be able to put together something that helps that helps them with their job, but also helps with that connection between. Well, least- every, every country, every city has a different policy. You know, we have the, the land. yeah, we have yeah, the laws yeah. of the land, of course. Right. But then every county, every state, every area has different things. We're not trying to change that. Right. You know, we're, we're not, I mean, if some administrator or something watches the film and decides, you know, geez, that makes sense. You know, maybe they shouldn't be smoking, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe we should, maybe we should, you know, these gut bomb stuff, maybe we hire a di- dietitian to, you know, come in and give these guys ideas so they can keep their bodies a little healthier. Or right. Maybe we do set a little time aside to train once a month. Oh, that sounds good. You know, Good. That's yeah, good. We have completed our job. If you're talking about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're doing more than what you say in the academy and it, at the beginning and the end or whatever, it's like yeah, certainly, certainly. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming on here and, and talking about your film, and uh, I wish you the absolute best of uh, success with this, and uh, hopefully we can help you. Uh, get a, a bit of an audience for this and uh, I want to say congratulations because as someone who has spent decades in the film and TV industry I know how hard it is to go from conception to actually dragging the darn thing across the finish line and it's a it's a major accomplishment so congratulations on that because that's um, that's always a job well done just getting the thing finished thank you Tim yeah we, we or, do appreciate it and like I said you know you know some of the coaches that are in it but we do have like another 15 people in the movie and they are really good. And uh, you guys like it. That I look forward to seeing because it's sometimes it's the, the folks you've never heard of that have something to say that are the gems, you know? Yeah. And uh, that I'm, I'm looking forward to getting in there and, and listening to what a lot of those folks have to say as well. Anything else you guys want to add about your film? No, you can, you can find postings and you're going to see links throughout. Uh, we'd love for people that are watching this to press the button and take a look at it. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's it, 20th, right? So it comes out the 20th and uh, we'll just go from there. But uh, hopefully it's something people talk about in a positive way. Absolutely. Yeah, our, our uh, Tim, our official site is located uh, at my production company site. It's www.lightningdigitalentertainment.com. And any, if any of you guys are on Twitter, my handle's at Jason Harney 72 and I'm also on LinkedIn. So we'll be posting about the film a lot there. And on the site, uh, there'll be links to the multitude of platforms that the film will be on as uh, these next couple of weeks transpire. Yeah. And so I'll have a QR code on a couple of my mm-hmm. Facebook pages. We've got a club page in Vegas called Rossi Fighting Arts Academy. There'll be a QR code probably there as well. So people can just have the simplicity of firing it up. All right. Well, that's a lot of places to go and find out some information. That's awesome. Oh, and I want to say real quick that John and I actually did not coordinate our wardrobes today. <laughs> I know. I was thinking I was the odd man out. I'm a little jealous hey, now. Get the memo. What's going on here? I was like, yeah. you know what? Let's support. Let's support one another. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we wear the same shirt, but that, I mean, it's funny. As many designs as there are, we picked literally the exact one, the exact. Same I know. One. I got the yellow ones and all the other ones. I'm like, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to wear this one today. Yeah, uh, man. And I, I guess we should give a shout out there. So, if you're interested in the kind of t-shirts that John and I are wearing, that's at the. Uh, www.inosanta.com, the uh, store there, and you can get all sorts of Inosanto Academy gear, t-shirts, hoodies, all kinds of things. So you should definitely go check that out. Lots of good lessons there still. So get Absolutely. down there. Get down Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And then uh, seminars going on pretty much all year round, you know, three times a year. Guru definitely does some open to the public seminars here in coordination with the instructor camps. And then there's some other big camps, so a lot of opportunities to come study with him here if people are interested, as well as just the regular classes, which are open to the public. Thank you, Tim. And- All right, again, gentlemen, thank you. It's so fantastic to see you both. And again, I wish you the, the best of uh, success with this documentary. And uh, hope to talk to you guys again sometime soon. All right, thank you. All right, take care. See you.